Ukraine. Uh, I'm Volko Trevers, and I'm only making a very small introduction in this lecture because uh, uh, many more important people will uh, start talking soon. I'd like to say uh, a big thanks for Margot and Natalia who uh, made all the practical arrangements ready and of course for Lilette who is also organizing this lecture together with so many new lectures to come. Because this is not the only lecture we are giving. It's, uh, it's going to be, I'm sorry, stop sharing. It's going to be a two, a two weekly um, a meeting uh, on Thursday evening. And uh, this is uh, the first one, but in two weeks, and I'm looking for my screen now where it is. In two weeks, we will have, um, um, I think I cannot find it, it just disappeared. Uh, in two weeks, uh, we will have, help me out, Lilette. <laughs> Robert Mill and uh, Nastia. Robert Mill and Nastia. I will show the pictures of these slides uh, in the end of the lecture uh, again. Um, I'm sorry. The, um, we start today with um, uh, Oleg Drozdov. He will introduce Roskvit. And after that, Lilette will give a, a, a lecture about um, what to do or not to do in post-war reconstruction. Um, it's very important to know that this will be recorded and also will be uh, shown afterwards on YouTube. So if you're not able to, uh, to visit the whole show today, or um, maybe if you know people who should see this also, please, uh, show them that we have this on YouTube as well. Second important thing is that uh, Natalia uh, uh, will uh, uh, organize the Q&A, so questions and ask, answers uh, in the end of this, uh, this meeting. And if you already have a question, please put it in the chat, then she can prepare the questions to be organized. And we do simultaneously English and Ukrainian. So uh, there is Olena and she is the perfect translator to uh, right away translate my English into Ukrainian and sometimes the other way around from Ukrainian to English because this is this international coalition that we stand for. Without further ado, I think I will give the floor to Oleg, um, uh, Oleg Drozdov, uh, founder of Roskvit. Yeah. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, welcome to our first event of Rosquit Foundation. And uh, I would like to tell you how it actually has happened and what we are all about. First of all, I would like to say that many things have changed tectonically changed, we have started to live in a different reality. And I guess several things, quite a few things have changed around us. And we have changed together with the themes. But before everything else, we have said goodbye to the post-Soviet past. We have opened our doors to to the world culture to the world economy and we are now um, taking our steps towards Europe. Also, I believe we are in a different uh, energy situation and it is about our sustainability and viability of our towns and villages. This is also a very changeable situation and our cities have been ruined and the process is still going on. 
when the war finishes, these cities will be different and we will be different together with them. Uh, many of us have incurred traumas, all sorts of traumas, and we have changed in ways that allowed us to work as one nation, uh, allowed us to come together and to construct a neuro network. We have gained the things we lacked before. For instance, we have found, discovered trust towards each other. We have found trust towards our state and this is a great chance for us to continue working after the war building our civil society and strive to live a better life and uh, live a better life in better cities and it is crucial to understand today how we are going to do it we are going to work together because the price for this peace it is going to be enormous we were thinking already that we already have quite a lot of um, initiatives, quite a lot of um, movements and activists who are going to start choosing from ready-made solutions for Ukraine. This was the first step. Secondly, we saw some tendencies to give us gifts, just um, come and get our gifts. But we believe only in one way, and this is the way that will change both urban and rural environments. And our way is to bring together experts from different countries and from Ukraine too. And this can give us a powerful impetus forward because um, we can both learn and work at the same time. We cooperate and we educate ourselves at the same time. And this growth of our potential will be incremental in this way. And together with the Hargiv School of Architecture, which provided us the platform for this urban coalition for Ukraine, um, we cooperate also with four uh, universities, KU Leuven, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Royal um, Technological Institute at Stockholm, and uh, TH Zurich, and uh, Amsterdam Art Academy. These are our uh, collaborants and partners. I will not now um, name each respected expert uh, who found the time to join us, but I can say that this is a team of very profound um, specialists united by one goal and um, their experience of working in Ukraine and with Ukraine and half of our team are national experts and they are young researchers, architects, historians, engineers We focused on five values 
and they uh, underpin the whole bulk of work that we do because we need to uh, to rebuild the country um, today we need to plan for decades ahead not only uh, for tomorrow but uh, we need to use the expertise of our team for years to come. And it is also very important that we need to to review our basic understanding, which um, about the city that we want to live in. I would like to mention that we are now in the situation of a breakthrough and our community is undergoing powerful changes and this gives us a lot of power also to change our cities. And this is the reason why we can believe that we will uh, change uh, the situation for the better. Another thing uh, is that our friends and the world on the whole um, is ready to help us, both financially and with uh, competences, with knowledge and expertise. And um, we should uh, not limit ourselves to some specific renovation jobs or uh, restoring things that were ruined, but also we must think that we must remember that we can um, change our environment to make it human focused, socially inclusive, and this principle of inclusion should be the should underpin all sorts of development and redevelopment of our cities our very important value is that we create a very powerful coalition which is going to work Um, together and this is going to be a big network uh, working together and uh, it is also very important that we have voiced and will continue to do so we have voiced the ethical values and we are working on such things and we are doing our job for everyone so it is also very important that we are not thinking only about some quick solutions but we are talking about sustainability so we have five goals First of all, this is about identity. This is the search for our future, for us actually, for our dignity and the search for a city which would accumulate all these aspects. We understand that rebuilding means rebuilding of life. And it's not only about physical rebuilding, but also it's about reconsideration uh, of public spaces, of villages, of cities. And this is uh, about rebuilding 
uh, within a time, certain specific time context. And um, this can span from the immediate jobs towards the far future. And the most important thing which is adjacent to our life, this is nature and climate, and we understand that everything that we are doing must be much more ecologically friendly than before. And we need to take this interaction with nature into the account, the clarity of air, the health of all the urban dwellers must be considered. We understand that architecture is responsible, highly responsible for the economics, which is part, because it is part of the uh, economic system. And when we are rebuilding something or developing something, we must also take into account uh, what economic and uh, just plain life activities we are planning within the built development. And we need to consider which economic models are efficient and which could provide answers. We understand that we cannot do anything uh, without uh, efficient governance. So we understand that we must change laws we must change methodologies and approaches approaches and our major goal is um, a change in our approach to administration and so we can see that first we must understand which values in the context of time we have now and uh, what kind of values we should include in our strategy and and then we must uh, underpin them with laws new laws new procedures etc so how does our work look like? What is our plan? We will start a few projects together and they will run in a parallel way. And maybe this is not going to be the in the forefront of our activities, but yet this will be the networking, the networking of educational establishments who are going to research, to do projects together um, about the future of Ukraine. Then, uh, from the very start, we will continue our communication with uh, public and civil institutions and we will um, we will start cooperation which can transform into something more serious and then um, uh, this is a beginning to start collaboration with the uh, community general public because we want to start slow and then to accelerate and uh, with our networking, um, joining uh, uh, more initiative, new initiatives and new uh, experts to it. And then we will um, do some intersectoral uh, processes and at once we understand that these would be master plans and the major document we would like to do is the uh, roadmap is the roadmap or guidebook call it whatever you wish 
and uh, it will be dedicated to the post-war cities of Ukraine and how these three major focuses FOSI, uh, are going to work together. Um, the same people are going to work within the three areas and so they will enrich um, each area and each other. And so this is how it is going to hold and work together. And we believe that this can be a way to more systemized, more profound understanding and maybe new documents, new regulations. Thank you very much. Yes, and uh, these These documents could um, could help us facilitate our movement forward. So, so the challenges that we are facing now and the strategy which we're working to deal with them, I guess, is a very important step before we continue with more detailed planning. Uh, dedicated to specific architectural objects. Thank you now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Oleg, uh, for this introduction. I see quite a lot of people uh, in the room. Um, for all of you, there is two languages simultaneously. If you need to have a translation, please click the bottom. Uh, it's down there about interpretation or translation in sense, and use the language that you like the best, Ukrainian or English. Uh, also, if you have, got, if you have any questions uh, and you already uh, know them and don't want to forget them, please put them in the chat. That will be for the last 15 or 20 minutes of this meeting, will be easier to, um, uh, to prepare a good discussion. Thank you. Next one. Keynote speaker of this lecture, Lilette Bredes. I think I'll just give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Foucault. And uh, again, welcome to everyone. I am super uh, glad to be here and, and to be part of this uh, coalition uh, put together uh, mostly by you, uh, Oleg. So, so thank you very much for that. I am um, happy to to be the first speaker, but also a bit uh, intimidated by it uh, as as addressing uh, you from from far. Uh, my home base is is Amsterdam, and I am an art historian actually, working already for years in architecture and. Um, researching uh, on the subject of uh, architecture in post-conflict and looking at uh, the potential and the possibilities for architecture in post-conflict situations. Um, I am going to share my screen now um, to start my presentation. I hope it works. Uh, can somebody not? Yeah, I saw. Um, so, uh, architecture of peace, rebuilding after conflict, what uh, not to do or what to do. Um, I am, as already Filco explained, uh, also being partly organizing this series of lectures that we're going to put forward uh, from Rosquit. And uh, what we try to do is to structure them uh, from the more general topics to the very uh, specific and in-depth uh, researches on specific topics that Roskit will be working on. So in the beginning, it will be the more um, general topics on how to deal with post-conflict situations. And then later on, we will really dig into all the 
the, the, the topics, the themes, the activities actually that the group is working on. So in the end, we will hope to have a, a wealth of uh, information uh, coming to you. Uh, the, the lecture series is kind of parallel to the, to the working of Roskvit as a team, as a coalition. Am I going okay in fastness for you, Elena? Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, just uh, say so if I go too fast or something is unclear. Absolutely, yeah, I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I am now trying to get to the next slide and failing. I don't know why. Okay, this works. Uh, so the extreme uh, first of um, yeah, what you can say about rebuilding in in, in post conflict situations is this duration of what they call in the world of conflict studies establishing positive peace uh, that is a period after which um, the fighting stopped but there is still a kind of uh, not complete resolution uh, people are not living together uh, in in total uh, harmonious cooperation let's say so this is what they call, and as you can see, it, it really can take a, a very long time to, to reach that point. Um, so that is an aspect that uh, we with Rosfit also work on, and that was already mentioned by Oleg, that time and timing is of crucial uh, uh, component in the whole thing. And the timing is changing very much in the different phases of the reconstruction. As you can imagine, in the beginning, the first phase, uh, directly after fighting is stopped, is of course emergency situation, looking for shelter, housing refugees, uh, creating basic infrastructure, and things need to go very fast. But in the second phase, uh, and that is something that we have been looking on and working on for the Architecture of Peace project mostly, is the phase that pe people resume everyday life. So uh, at the same time, there is no real coordination yet. There is still a lack of control. Not everything is settled uh, and clear. And in that period, a lot can go wrong. So there we are in the, in the don'ts uh, uh, area and not in the do's. And that is, uh, I mentioned them here, uh, uh, communities can exist, people try to defend themselves or build big walls. Illegal settlements, uh, people just building on ground that might not even be theirs. A lot of urban sprawl is often happening. So there's a lot of elements happening in that phase that at the same time can go wrong. But on the other hand, it is a phase where a lot of opportunities and possibilities uh, are arising. And that is, therefore, I think exactly why Roskvit is so important, because it's exactly this phase that we want to intervene and do very well. And that is what we are basically preparing in this phase, in, in this uh, period that we are in now, to, to look at methods, systems, implementations, knowledge, uh, providing that in, in trying to prevent a lot of mistakes that happened in other places. Uh, and then you have a third phase that I will not spend too much uh, time on now. It's uh, the phase where really everything is established and you can also see that uh, basically the things are needed and in every new planning process of a city are needed and uh, Ukraine probably is very well equipped to do so. Um, I need to do my slide different, but this works. Um, a second very important thing is uh, learned from conflict studies, and that is a kind of mismatch in the level of support and the need in support. So the moment that the conflict breaks out, there's a lot of attention of media, international politics. Uh, people are, are really keen on it. You, you can see that now, of course, uh, with the Ukraine very much. But uh, at the same time, there is a need for support and the need for support stretches over a very long time. And you can already see this 
huge gap between the moment when the need for support is the highest and the media attention and the political attention are uh, lowering and already back in, in, into the next phase. Uh, then the third uh, element is the capacity, because in the beginning there's a lot of capacity, which is mainly people uh, going away from the country or very occupied with basics and survival. And the moment that they, that all that capacity is back, uh, again, uh, the attention, the money and uh, the, the, the support uh, has diminished. So this is a, a very crucial uh, thing to keep in mind, how to keep that attention, how high, how to basically save that money for a later period. But also, and I think therefore this coalition is very important and uh, the, the school of uh, Oleg Trostov is very important, the architecture school of Kharkiv, uh, and that is the capacity, which is basically the students. It's the young people of uh, the Ukraine, the young architectural students who are now preparing themselves and staying in the country and preparing in themselves to be uh, there in this very crucial phase. I am showing now a very short video, but I really would like to show it. Uh, I hope the sound works well for you all, uh, because this is and an, the next part of my talk will be about learning from learning from others. And here is uh, a Syrian friend uh, learning from uh, people in Lebanon, basically asking for help to them. Uh, he's Syrian living in the Netherlands. He couldn't travel to Lebanon when we were going there and he gave us this, uh, this little video. So I'm showing it now. Lillian, no sound. Uh, uh, Lillian, sorry, no, no sound. Super sorry. Uh, this means and they learned me yesterday. I am sorry that I needed to say share sound. Next time I'll listen better. Uh, should work now. My name is Bengin Daoud and I'm an architect. I studied in yes. Damascus and I worked in Damascus. And uh, I worked in Beirut partly, I worked in Dubai. And in 2013 I moved to the Netherlands and I'm doing my uh, second master in city planning now. But I also uh, moved with a message to uh, learn and understand how I can come back one day and rebuild my country. And uh, since then, uh, what I discovered uh, from studying examples and learning about experiences is that what I want to uh, learn about is grasping the soul of the city, how I call it, maybe it's a little bit poetic, but uh, I think that explains also to you guys maybe that uh, rebuilding is not only about physical uh, uh, appearance and it's not about streets, it's not about buildings, it's not about materials, it's more about the invisible layers, the layers which we try to catch, it's about the smell of the city, it's about the memories of the city, it's about even the blood would happen in the city. So for me, I was, I'm uh, still fascinated of what happened in Beirut and is still happening. The non-stop development, the non-stop uh, movement. If it's in a good direction or uh, sometimes not, if it's uh, succeeded or not. Uh, I'm sending you this message with a big question for help actually. Because I would like to learn from your experience and I would like to hear what your opinion about what happened in Beirut and what is still happening in Beirut and how can we make that different in the future in the Syrian city? Yes, uh, indeed this, this brings me to, to Beirut. Um, and, and I showed it also because I, I share so much what he said and I think it's so important to remember and I think Oleg already mentioned it. Uh, it's about the soul of the city. It's not about the bricks only. It, it's so much more than that. And to keep that in mind is so important. And 
My route is uh, an example I'm going to give, and and as I said, I'm going to focus now on two domes. Uh, one of them is Beirut. This is Beirut in um, 1991, directly after a civil war that, that was there from 1975 until 1990. 15 years of civil war. Uh, this was a result. Uh, this was a result. The, the buffer zone, let's say the green line, uh, totally grown over uh, because it was not used at that time. So what to do afterwards, a completely destroyed city center and how to deal with that. So what did uh, the government do? Uh, the government of Lebanon uh, created a firm. Uh, they were called Solidaire. They still exist. They're still called Solidaire. And uh, basically the whole area was put under their uh, guidance, let's say. Um, but it was a private developer and to, let's say, they set to protect the public interest. Uh, there was a, a high uh, stock or, or share of it uh, dealing with the government. But basically that was also the big mistake. So it was the government, a private company who were completely interwoven. So it was a pipe public private enterprise of one big uh, company, basically, uh, who we did the whole city center. They did it because it needed to be fast, they thought, and um, it was a very compli complicated situation of ownership of all the different buildings. So what they did is they handed out shares for the owners of the building. Uh, with the idea that they could buy the share back later. They made very complicated rules and, and very high standards for the renovation of the buildings, which created uh, basically an impossible situation for people not to, to hand over their property uh, for the shares because they could never live up to that expectation of rebuilding. So basically they had no choice. Uh, they were actually evacuated, you can say it like that. Uh, so everything, every single building was in the hands of Solidaire at some point, and they started to basically create a tabula rasa for creating a whole new city heart. That means that a lot of people actually say, I don't know the exact numbers, but a lot of people say that there was even more destroyed in the city center, in the heart, through the reconstruction, through actually demolishing the buildings for recreating the new heart, then that were destroyed during the war itself, which is, of course, a, a very bad situation. Uh, the city was a fine, the heart, the core, the center was a fine mesh of small little alleys, uh, small entrepreneurs, uh, people were living there very life situation of souks, shops, uh, housing uh, and entertainment at the same time. This uh, was replaced by uh, a commercial center, a lot of commercial interest, uh, actually quite um, expensive high-end uh, shop owners, uh, owners of buildings very often immediately bought uh, by people from the Gulf region who uh, wanted to go back to, to Beirut because it always has been a very, uh, yeah, let's say, uh, wanted place to go to uh, for especially Gulf region. So everything basically went wrong in, the, in this place. Uh, they did try to maintain uh, some of the archaeological foundings, but that was a very strong lobby from the archaeologists uh, and they failed very often as well. So a lot was destroyed there. And what was recuperated is now basically part of, let's say, one big shopping mall. The whole area is one big shopping mall. It looks like this and it looks now like this. Uh, this is, is, I think, one of the best examples of the failure of this situation. 
the people could not buy back their shares. Everything became far too expensive. The people who lived there were also completely not being asked what to do there. They, they played no role whatsoever. And in the end, the money played the biggest role. So it really looks like this, uh, a dead city heart. And, and that is a disaster for a city. You can see here how it's being barricaded and it's being done uh, by, the, by the military uh, because there were so many protests. Uh, it, it, that Solidaire area also became uh, the heart of the protest uh, against the government because there it all played out. There it became so clear what was wrong in the government. So you see here also thieves, mafia, graffiti on those, uh, those uh, roadblocks. Uh, this was uh, some years later in Beirut, 2016, where there was again uh, a big um, destruction through the, that was the last war in, in um, actually I see that I made a mistake, it's 2006, I'm very sorry. Uh, this is the war from Hezbollah and Israel. And uh, they destroyed the whole part where, um, which was mostly in the hands of Hezbollah uh, and completely destroyed that. And this was rebuilt uh, by Hezbollah, who really said, we know what went wrong in city center. We're going to do this ourselves for our people. And they basically managed to do it. And I would claim they did a better job and were more uh, inclined to, to work with their community than, than the central government uh, was in, in the, the Solidaire case. This is also about this 2000, uh, what did I put there, 2019. So this is uh, what happened, what grew uh, around the city center. You have this uh, huge privatization of the coastal line. Uh, there is almost no public beach anymore. And that was also in an exchange created with Solidaire that they had to keep the city center low, uh, low rise, which didn't make much money. So if they would make uh, that, keep it on a certain height, then they could here build as high as they wanted. And that created, as you can see, a huge amount of very expensive buildings on, on again, public ground. Uh, there is one guy resisting. Uh, there's a lot of people resisting, but this is a very nice, beautiful story, actually, of a, of a hotel owner who owns this very old, beautiful Hotel St. George uh, on the beach. Uh, or in the harbor, basically. And uh, he is refusing to, to leave, basically, and to go out. And uh, so the building is empty and he just keeps it there. He sometimes rents it out for, for huge weddings or parties. Uh, and for the rest, he is just using it as, as a billboard, basically, as a, as a scar in the city to show like, I am not leaving. I am not going to let you build uh, a new hotel over here uh, in, in your way. This is the last in Beirut, August, uh, where the harbor was uh, exploded and exploded part of the city center again. And I'm showing it partly uh, to show you this, uh, where he turned the whole note around and said Solidaire has stopped. So first it was stop Solidaire and now Solidaire has stopped in the sense that uh, the city heart uh, as it is now is completely bankrupt. So it is not only not successful for the citizens of Beirut, or the old people were living there, uh, the, the, the old inhabitants, but it's not successful for nobody. It's, it's also not successful for, let's say, the company themselves or, or the people behind it. It is basically a, a huge failure that exists because this is now 2022, this picture. Uh, so we're talking now 30 years of, uh, of reconstruction and how basically one huge uh, decision 30 years ago determined uh, to, to still this existing situation that didn't better. Another don't uh, is Pristina and Kosovo, but then in a to totally other way. Therefore, I choose those two examples. So you could say 
uh, in Beirut, there was too much government, there was too much power in one hand towards private company and government who, who set the rules and did it all together. In Pristina, uh, directly after uh, the war ended in 1999, uh, this kind of uh, weird building started to erase. Uh, this was people coming back uh, from diaspora, they, they had fled uh, the country. They all came back and there was almost no government in place. There, there was a very chaotic situation of, of governing and uh, there were no rules and regulations for building. So people just had their plot, sometimes even grabbed public land uh, and started to build on it. And like this, uh, situations like this, there was no zoning, there was not like this is housing and this is for work, uh, there was no height limits, as you can see here, they just started building upon other buildings, uh, which created uh, a huge um, unsafe situation in, in many ways, uh, physically, uh, because sometimes construction was simply like this. Uh, who knows how structurally safe this is to put uh, this amount of, of weight on other houses, uh, but also in terms of fire escapes, in terms of um, uh, building laws and regulations, but also socially in, in the first picture that I showed, this one you can see that actually you live, you look uh, into, into the bathroom of your neighbors or, or the bedroom, which is also not very uh, nice, probably. Um, another thing is that in this period, it was, it's, it's, it's the numbers, it's like 75% of the, of the city of Pristina is built illegally in that period, 75%. And that means, of course, that if you want to do something about that later on, you have a big problem because it's 75% of the people. I mean, they also did it themselves. So how to change that situation? Um, a problem that also they are still working on right now. This is where I surely uh, transform to the to the dues. Uh, this is a project in Pristina, actually, where the two guys to the left are talking to the mayor of Pristina to to find a system to to turn this around uh, and put at least uh, basic rules and regulations for building in place, but then. Uh, do that also with the existing buildings. And you can do that only if you have indeed the people uh, who, who are um, uh, part of it, uh, make them, involve them and, and let them be uh, enthusiastic, about, enthusiastic about it and, and take them with you. And that's what uh, they try to do with uh, the guy to the left on, on the screen, who is also a famous television host uh, in, in uh, Kosovo, who uh, made a whole campaign on television to really involve the people. And that is uh, what I want to stress in those two examples. So in this case, there was not enough government, there was not enough rules, there was not enough in place. In Beirut, there was too much in place. And I think for Ukraine, we have to, to find a way in between uh, because what they both had in common is that there was a lot of um, economic interest. Uh, so there were parties uh, who, who could benefit enormously from this situation. And what was not enough in place, that was actually the benefit of people of citizens uh, and they were not involved basically in both cases on how to do this together and that is uh, well Oleg just explained the values and the goals and I think one of the the main values uh, we expressed in in this situation is actually how to do it together with people and how to create newer forms of uh, collaboration between private partners, um, public partners, and, uh, and the citizens. So how let citizens collaborate and cooperate uh, with local or uh, national governments. So then I come to some do's uh, that would seem now, if, if you look 
at this list and you see them you think yeah they're so obvious this is uh, every architect should do this so this is basically what is an architect you should do in situation like post-conflict um, yes they are obvious yes that should become part of a kind of ethical code maybe even that that the architect should adhere to um, but at the same time I think they work very well. They work when you really are doing a project and you take some time and go through them almost like a tick box. Like, am I really thinking about the continuity of my project? Is it really able to continue after I'm gone? Uh, is this the ownership one? The ownership is not about uh, owning in the sense of it's mine but it's very much, I take responsibility for it. So even if you rent a house, you can feel ownership for the house. How to create that feeling uh, of a project that the people that, that use it become owners in the sense of, of feeling it uh, being uh, their own. Those things are super important in general, but even much more important in post-conflict situations. They have to, uh, to make it their own and, and we have to create it that, that it's felt like that. Um, I'm going through some very random examples now. Uh, no, they're not random. They're very well chosen, uh, but <laughs> it's um, random in the sense that they come from all different parts in the world and um, chosen because they they show strategies, they show elements that occur in different situations. And I think we can learn from uh, also from the situation in Ukraine. Uh, Baji Babur Gardens is in Kabul, Afghanistan. It looks like this. Uh, and there, this is done by the Aga Khan Foundation. And in Kabul, uh, everything was so completely destroyed that people were saying to them, great what you're going to do here, but why a park? Why do you start with a park? We need hospitals, we need houses, we need, uh, they need, it was not we, it was like other people saying about the Afghans what they would need. Uh, but they talked to the Afghans uh, because they, they're part uh, of, of the whole coalition of, of the Khan, and uh, they started to work on the park and because it was a super old guard, uh, garden basically, it's a garden for Babur and Babur is one of the founders of Afghanistan, he is actually the founder. Uh, this is his tomb that he completely renovated and by creating this tomb, it, it almost like recreated the country, uh, it, it created the identity of the shared identity of the people from very uh, long time ago when the, all the people were, 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 who were living then were living uh, good in a good and harmonious way together. Uh, this is the park as it is now. The renovation of the park, uh, it provided all the tick boxes. It, it provided uh, a lot of work opportunities. So there was a lot of people employed was a lot of education for people involved because there were very old techniques used in the garden that they recuperated so there was a lot of renovation techniques working with uh, older methods uh, that they got back uh, irrigation method but that also the workers could use later in in other places uh, and they created basically a safe space for families, which is uh, public and which is a place uh, that the only place in, in Kapul that, that people still can uh, enjoy in, in a public sphere with the whole family. Uh, Beyond Palestine, I I chose because this shows it is about uh, renovation and it is about uh, uh, heritage. So the cultural heritage, the Rivak, uh, as you can see, created this project for 50 villages in Palestine to uh, 
to do a renovation project and a heritage project in a very as you can basically see here very well uh humble way very simple uh but rebuild those houses you can see there are um uh, solar panels uh, being placed there uh there are water system being in place there and it's just a very simple but well done renovation you can see the solar panel here i'm sorry it's um the project is about that it's about giving back identity it's about giving back uh employment again all those elements are in that very much about ownership the people who lived here after they own the place it's theirs but a very important aspect here is politics because what they did is through heritage through um recreating this in this huge program they knocked on the door, of course, of UNESCO. And there they became a member of UNESCO. Palestine, a country that doesn't exist, that is not recognized by any international organization, is recognized by UNESCO, which is a UN organization. So it was an extremely, let's say, smart move to become part of an organization through heritage, to something, um, let's say innocence as, as, uh, as a heritage project and, and making a beautiful village. In that sense, I mention it here because uh, architecture and, and rebuilding can be a very powerful tool also in, in political issues uh, and, and economical. Uh, the Red Location Museum I chose, it is a museum in uh, South Africa uh, and it is very much about uh, uh, memory and, and uh, uh, commemoration of, of apartheid and what happened there. And as you can see, it's, it's beautiful blended in its surroundings, but it's not so much about the architecture, but about how they did it. In every post-war situation, almost every, there is a huge problem on how to commemorate that. What do you do with the memories? What do you do with the history? And in a lot of places uh, that is simply blocked because nobody can decide what to do because everybody has another memory. And the moment that you build a museum to, to show a history or a memory, you kind of light up the fire again. You, you kind of renew a conflict or you, you tell a one-sided story. There are always more stories in, in post-conflict situation. Uh, and that they did very beautiful here. They, they are called memory boxes. Uh, so it consists the whole museum of, uh, of multiple boxes where different stories are being told all the time. And you can tell your own story there, basically. You can fill the place with your own story and then it's being changed by another one. So the multiplicity of histories, the multiplicities of memories is getting a physical space and that works very well there in, in, in that area. Uh, Skatiscan is my last example and, and I show it uh, maybe because it has nothing to do with architecture. Uh, as you can see, it, it is a very um, uh, ugly building maybe, it's, it's like nothing. Um, inside is, is a skate school. It's in Kabul. Uh, it is uh, for children from six until 18 or 25, it doesn't matter. Uh, where they learn skating, but they also learn multiple other skills. Uh, it is a bit, again, it's a pretext. The whole skating is a pretext to to do education. Afghanistan, of course, there is still a problem with women education or girls emancipation uh, under the pretext of indeed, uh, that was my 30 minutes, uh, which is good because I'm always almost finished. Um, kids enjoy, uh, they learn stuff and it brings not something only to them, but also to the city itself. It brings so much joy in those streets if they go out and they're just there with this bunch, it's, it's 
it's pleasure and and it's so important to have that at, at, at moments like that and and then afghanistan is, is one dust road all the time but then they come and yeah you can't uh, help but uh, but laugh with them um that's indeed my last example so um i'm good in my timing um this is a lot of the books uh, that i quoted from and and that we we kind of uh, uh pasted some things in together. This is one last slide. Thank you. And I'll stop my share here. Thank you so much, Lilette. Natalia, did you already see some things in the chat? Um, no, unfortunately, I see no questions. Um, just to begin, maybe I prepared my, one question myself. and. Um, yeah, I am from Kharkiv, and uh, from the situation there, I know that uh, the major, the mayor of this city, is already planning for a build, and um, it seems like the situation there is um, uh, one of the don'ts uh, that Lilette uh, mentioned. Um, before the war, we had the monopoly of the big developers, and after the war, uh, it seems to continue. Our mayor, he already declares that he will rebuild uh, the microrayons uh, for, um, it's not known for whom, but uh, uh, with the help of the major developers like uh, uh, Jules Troy One uh, that we have had uh, before the war, uh, they produce a lot of uh, low quality high rise uh, uh, housing. And um, um, what are the ways of the civil society to limit uh, this, to stop this? Uh, convincing. <laughs> so uh, create it, it's. Of course, for for mayors, it's it's not uh, it's it's not an easy task, and and mayors are not prepared for situations like this, uh, and and luckily not. So it is also not easy. If it, if it would be you or me, you would just standing there, and and you suddenly have your whole city being uh, completely uh, destructed, and and you have to act. Uh, and somebody comes with a money and a plan and said we're going to do it like this, then it's uh, it's not always to to blame immediately. Uh, but what you can show is is alternatives um, and uh, collaborate basically, come together. So what you, your question was, what can you do as as a civic society? And that is be strong together. So build networks, uh, work together and be super informed, really informed about uh, indeed the do's and don'ts come with those examples. The examples I showed really show like here it went wrong because of this and this and this. And you can take one of the examples and there are many more from other countries and go much more in depth than I did now. So much more detailed and further and and show it and, and put it in the face like if you do this in 30 years you will have problems that are worse than than the problem that you have now if you do it like this it probably will go faster in the end and that's another thing that that a lot of uh local uh governments think like if you involve the people it will all go slower that was the whole argument in in beirut uh, and it's simply not true because we're now 30 years further 30 years further and and nothing is solved uh so involving the people is not always uh slower it's it's very often even faster so be informed uh, and and stick together. That's maybe the the main. But maybe Oleg has some answer as well or thoughts about it. Yeah. I think it is uh, quite important in beginning to realize uh, 
uh, what happened and maybe which city we want to rebuild because uh, I think uh, these uh, pictures completely change it. And, and also it's very important to formalize and express your dream. And maybe this every building, every rebuild, rebuild building, every street, uh, every path have to be way to this uh, better future. Or see to dream. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for answering. Um, it looks like a perfect uh, uh, motto for doing something. I wrote down be informed, stick together, and express your dream, which is very inspiring. Oh, we have uh, one question. Uh, we, yeah. um, um, we have a question from uh, Jonathan Hassel, and it goes, um, thank you very much for all these examples of rebuilding success, but for me, they seem to be rather individual projects in the city than comprehensive rebuilding projects. Uh, isn't your opinion successful rebuilding the accumulation of successful projects, or would you say that there is a need for over uh, reaching uh, frame for uh, an overreaching framework framework or concept well yeah super relevant question uh, this is um, I must say that I believe very much in a new way of uh, of building cities, maybe in general, and that is in these new coalitions. So the whole idea of uh, working with citizens in, an, in a new network with uh, local authorities and doing that on a neighborhood level is, uh, I think, a, a very viable option to, um, uh, to work on neighborhoods and cities in the future. There's a lot of experiments going on with that already, uh, even within the, the Rosquid group. Uh, we will come to that in, in, in a later stage. Um, but then it becomes, of course, a matter of scaling. So how to, to scale this up so that it becomes on the city level. And neighborhood examples can be scaled up. So if on the neighborhood level, you create a good example uh, that becomes a kind of, yeah, you say overreaching concept, uh, that is a kind of overreaching concept or method. So it is a new way of creating new rules uh, that give more uh, options for, for citizens to fill in those rules uh, together with architects, uh, the rules put from the government but more flexible uh, than, than they used to be. So I don't believe in huge overall master plans that, uh, that determine, let's say, all the, uh, the exact position of things, but there needs to be an overall uh, rule set. Uh, that is something very important that that, that that is in place. And then within that, kind of uh, field that you created, you can have a lot of flexibility to make infills uh, with, with smaller projects, uh, as you called it. We, thank you, thank you, Delight. We have another question, it's in Ukrainian, I will try to translate. Uh, it goes, it, it, it's related actually to what you just said. Um, the question is, Tell please more about the process of the urban design that you use. Uh, did you analyze uh, the specifics of the Ukrainian uh, contexts uh, compared to uh, the international examples that you uh, provided? Uh, no, because I can't. Uh, I don't know enough of, of, of that context. Uh, I. I know of a lot of other places in, in post-conflict. I also know that a lot of things are not comparable uh, because things are local and specific in specific places, but still 
I hope that the notions that I mentioned uh, are, um, let's say, uh, general that you can apply also to other places. And especially, of course, what, what I call the factors for success are applicable, uh, as I say, basically in any uh, architectural situation. But no, I, do, I don't know the, the, the exact context. Uh, there are within Roskvit, of course, the people who know that. But I, I choose my examples to show um, also the variety, let's say, of strategies you can take as an architect. It, it Maybe also to, to show the agency of the potential of architecture that you can deal indeed with the economy, you can deal with politics, you can deal with uh, renewable energy methods, uh, you can deal with nature, you can deal with social fabric. So you, you have a lot of potential in architecture in different strategies that, that you choose. Thank you. Mm. We have no questions uh, more, but we have one comment from Natalia Lukashenko. Uh, and she says that uh, um, in Ukraine, uh, there was just uh, passed a law that obliges uh, the local authorities to, um, to, make, to, to, to plan uh, the programs of the renovation and uh, uh, the development of that of these projects uh, requires uh, public uh, hearings, the discussion with the uh, general public. Uh, this is good news, of course, um, but uh, um, as we know before, uh, those public hearings were also, uh, were, uh, um, they were also obliged to have them, but uh, they uh, had them after the, after the project was done, and then it created uh, immediately a conflict because the project is already developed, and then uh, people come and discuss what is wrong, and uh, uh, the developers of the project and uh, the people uh, are immediately in opposition. And uh, unfortunately, I don't know uh, this new law. Uh, did it? Uh, uh, did it uh, correct this uh, issue or not? But we will see. <laughs> yeah, but I, I think this is a very important issue that is being brought up because everyone, I mean, I talk now kind of about participation or involvement of citizens. Any architect, any developer, any uh, policymaker who will work on the Ukraine will say that it will involve citizens. And that is exactly the point, like all these so-called participatory projects are so often just basically telling what is the plan and then hoping for approval or coming there and immediately a fight starts. So that is not participation is not uh, putting a proposal and then uh, uh, you can say yes or no or you can choose the color green or blue it's really a different way of involving people from the very start in what are we going to do and let them think with you on the on the dilemmas and that's indeed where people are often afraid of that it will take too long, uh, but that if it will take maybe a week longer, it will save you back all the time of protest, all the time of resistance, all the time of non-ownership when you've done that project. And that is crucial because then you really have people on board because they know the dilemmas, they're part of that. And I, I think therefore, Pristina is a very good example. Uh, is if the people would have started it differently, it would not have ended in a mess like it is now. Yeah, thank you. Um, my. Um, yeah, mo mo yeah. Mo should add that, uh, pro, uh, pro and I would like to add a little bit about the master plan. Uh, mm -hmm. I would like to add um, here uh, that. 
то, що ми користуємось, the чим fact, це, це такий сталінський uh, такий концепт методології, та, він uh, concept, uh, з постійним um, якимось розгортанням міста, which, та, і він більше про uh, зонування території жилые, та, та промысловые. Um, да? the the and the, uh, areas. И uh, він and, um, фіксує то, що є. Да? Fixes там там нема нема постійних трансформацій. І зовсім the, інша річ. Uh, це, it doesn't have uh, any transformative potential. And і там, повертаючись до Хінпана, у нього всього чотири таких шара, а, це, це, це зонування. Це uh, uh, so, uh, like, uh, зонування. Зонування, транспорт, зелений, насадження, коридори. І, Green corridors. І, і, і майже все. And so, that is it. So, а якщо ми говоримо про, про, про мастер-плани, вони набагато конкретніші. І вони They вже опрацьовуються, коли є стратегічний план. Розуміння, що, що як трансформується економіка на базі статистичних даних, які інтегрується набагато більше шаров. І він більш конкретний, і він постійно змінюється. Agree. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, one is um, about Norman Foster. Um, the, uh, the, author, <laughs> the author of the question says, I hesitate to bring up Norman Foster, as this lecture has been so thoughtful, and I don't want to undermine that. But I have to ask about thoughts on Norman Foster's manifesto and meeting with Mayor uh, Igor Terehov. Uh, so please, uh, sh shortly <laughs> about that. Yeah, I, I would like to answer that. I don't want to spend too many thoughts on it. Um, and but i did of course and it it is indeed uh, a question of how to um basically how to counter um this thing that can become the example that i could give in a lecture uh in in 10 years or 30 years um it it is um somebody from the outside and who says uh, of course there is the same tick box that they, they will also say we will do it with participation we will do it with people from the ukraine we will do it with our network and we bring money but basically i think if if you saw how how rosquit coalition is being created being formed that that comes really from people from Ukraine. And I think that is already the huge difference. Uh, all, all the foreigners like me, we are like, the guests in the room. Uh, the moment Norman Foster enters, he is the host and uh, and and the yeah the the the, the, the circle around which a whole project will will develop. And that is very often with with uh, uh let's say the, the starge texts uh in general it's not only in post-war situations but in so many places and i will not say that every big architect is making bad uh, things but a lot of things are created uh without considering really considering a context in which it is built and maybe it's that let's let's put it that way um 
maybe you can do that in let's call it Dubai, but that's not a nice example. Maybe you can do that in, in Paris or you can do that in, in London. But in a lot of places or, or neighborhoods in London, you should definitely not do that. You cannot build contextless. You cannot build without consideration. What do the people you really want? What is working in this concept, what not? Therefore, you need people who are living there or are in there. And uh, in a post-conflict situation, that becomes even more sensitive. So maybe it's that what is already there normally is more sensitive. It's more important to do it right in that sense. So I think local embedment uh, is is super important. And then uh, foreign eyes can help uh, to, to contextualize even, but not the other way around. So maybe it's that would be my answer. Thank you. Uh, we, can, we have one more question, which looks like, more like a comment. It uh, says about the flexibility. Uh, the author, uh, Martin, uh, the mas I'm not sure I can read. Correctly. The Massonier. The Massonier, yeah. 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 She writes, uh, very important in the development of any city, be it new or reconstruction, is building flexible master plans and buildings. Don't design for specific functions. Let uh, but let space be flexible so that functions and occupation can change in time. This is also anticipating on the needs of current and future citizens inhabitants. Yeah, cannot more agree. <laughs> and uh, we have two more questions in chat uh, and they are connected. I, I, I think I can connect them together. They are about the municipalities. Um, uh, uh, Hlipan Tipenko uh, asks, um, have you, have your organization already tried to connect with municipality? If not, how do you think uh, to reach the authorities in the future so the knowledge elaborated here uh, reaches uh, them too? And uh, the, um, yes, the connected uh, uh, question was from Miroslav, and he asks, uh, could you please comment more about the role of state and uh, local self-government in rebuilding cities? Yeah, I think the, the latest question uh, uh, tried to connect with the municipality, and it's really Oleg to, to answer that, and maybe the first one as well. Can you take those both? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, I could, yeah. First of all, uh, yeah, very important to um, to share some kind of knowledges and narrative, and uh, to in time to have a common language to 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 uh, provide some kind of I don't know exercise to to uh, uh, create or. Um, provide this common language and and if we do this uh, if we go through this uh, first uh, very important point it's it will be some kind of negotiation and most important part may be to um, to share uh, not just the knowledge and first of all its values uh, maybe a step by step to to go to this way but also a uh, municipality could give um, some uh, super urgent uh, and very, very real um, view to the city problem. So this is very important in our, uh, um, in our way of researching and uh, thinking about that to keep this relation stronger. And we have, already several um, potential cooperation with the uh, municipalities, but also we keep our um, uh, cooperation with the uh, Ministry of uh, um, Regional Development and also a very important, uh, this kind of uh, relations.
Thank you, Oleg. I think this is, um, these are the questions for now. I also see that we have uh, made it for almost 90 minutes. So um, this, uh, this was very good as a, as a first lecture and a very nice questions, very important questions also. And inside many of the questions, there were not only questions, but there were also tips and tricks maybe for us and for our coalition and also the network around us, what we can work on in the near future. So thank you for all those comments and, and uh, positive words. Um, I think uh, there's two more things I'd like to um, uh, tell uh, all of you uh, next, of course, next to thanking uh, the organization of this meeting, Oleg, Lilette, Margot, Natalia, uh, and Olena to, uh, to uh, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for taking care of this. And here, this is the, uh, the important uh, part of, uh, do you see the screen now with the lectures? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the important part for the next few weeks. So we are going to do this every two weeks at Thursday at, at seven o'clock Ukrainian time. We try to do it bilingual like we did it like, like now. Uh, if you have any tips for this, please help us out. But uh, we hope this was a success. And on the 9th of June, so in two weeks, we have Robert Mull and Anastasia Ponomariova. And on the 23rd of June, we have Philip Boiser and Miriam Niemeyer. So these are the next two lectures that we're going to organize. And like I said in the beginning, we're also going to put them on YouTube. And of course, this brings me to the uh, media and social media part. Please follow us and like us and do uh, uh, connect to with us and connect other people uh, to Roskvit on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, by email and on LinkedIn. And uh, let's uh, get this movement uh, growing and growing. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Thank you for your attention. Again, Oleg, Lilet, thank you so much for your information and hope to see you in two weeks. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. Bye bye. Yeah. Have see a great you. night. See you all. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Elena.